right. Well, we are talking this morning about being stuck in chronic busyness. And it's ironic that I am doing this sermon today because I had an incredibly busy week. So I'm coming fresh off of it. But if you'll turn in your scriptures here to Luke's Gospel, uh, chapter 10, we're going to be in verse 38 through 42. And as we're turning there, I just wanted to read you kind of this opening passage here from the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 6, verses uh, 25 through 27, and it says, That is why I tell you not to worry about everyday life, whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear. Isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns, for your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't, they, aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? As we consider this topic, chronic busyness, I want us to wrestle this morning with this question from God's Word. Can all your worries add a single moment to your life? Martha and Mary had to answer this question later, and we're going to get into that in just a moment. And back then it was custom for a teacher or a rabbi to travel from town to town when he was preaching. As a sign of respect, when the teacher would come into the town, he would stay with locals in that area. And as I was preparing for this weekend's message, I connected something that I had never connected before. Some of us have probably heard the story of Mary and Martha before, but I certainly had never connected the dots of where this would sit in Luke's gospel. If you'll turn with me to Luke 10.38, and while you're turning there, I just want to remind you of kind of what comes right before that. Um, it's the story of, a, of the Good Samaritan. Um, and here's just a quick recap of it. This expert of the religious law stood up to test Jesus, and he asked him, what should I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus responded, asking, what does the law of Moses say about this? And he responded, you must love the, love, love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Um, and then you must love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus responded, he said, good job, thumbs up, you got it. And then the man, the Bible says the man wanted to justify his actions, actions. So he asked Jesus, well, who's my neighbor? And so Jesus told him the story of a Jewish man traveling from Jerusalem to Jericho who had been attacked by bandits and he was left for half dead on the road. While laying there, a priest first came by and noticed the man was struggling, but he passed him on by. Secondly, a temple assistant came by, noticed the man was struggling, and he too passed him by. And the way the story goes, a Samaritan passed him, noticed him, and had compassion for him, stopped what he was doing, went over and cared for the man, took him to an inn, and basically just took care of him. So Jesus answered this trick question with a question of his own, and he said to this guy, now which one of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man? Well, caught in this kind of uh, uh, trap here, he said, well, of course, the one who gave him mercy. And Jesus said, now you go and do the same. Isn't that interesting, though? I mean, the first thing to go by the wayside when we become overwhelmed with our busyness is our lack of time for people. The priest and the temple assistant both passed him up. They had an opportunity to fulfill the law of Moses in just one simple thing, to treat this person as a neighbor, but instead they were so busy and they were so focused on themselves that they missed this man sitting right next to them. In the passage right before Mary and Martha, Jesus summed up the religious law all 613 commandments of it into the simplicity of these two statements. Love your, the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all your mind, and then love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus simplified the core focus for the people of God, the people that we would like to call ourselves, to be to love God with everything that we have and to love the people who came into our lives as we love ourselves. It's with this context that we come into today's passage as we continue to wrestle with the question, can all of the things that we worry about add a single moment to our life? So it's with that context that as they were continuing their journey to Jerusalem, we pick up in Luke chapter 10, verses 38. The Bible says, as Jesus and the, the uh, disciples continued on their way to Jerusalem, they came to a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed them into her home. Her sister, Mary, sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he had taught. But Martha was distracted by the big dinner that she was preparing. She came to Jesus and said, Lord, doesn't it seem unfair to you that my sister just sits here while I do all the work? Tell her to come and help me. But the Lord said to her, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all of these details. There is only one thing worth being concerned about. 
Mary has discovered it, and it will not be taken away from her. Her sister Mary sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he taught, but Martha was distracted by that big dinner that she was preparing. While Martha was being so busy doing things, doing all of the good things, things that she thought that she had to do if she was going to be a responsible host, she was so busy doing that that she missed the one thing that was truly important, a relationship with Jesus. You ever been there? I mean, have you ever been distracted in the last six months, month, week? I mean, man, even hour? Have you ever been distracted, worried, burned out, stressed out, maxed out, burning the candle at both ends? I mean, have you ever been so focused on the things that you're doing that you've missed opportunities that God has placed right in front of you to connect with him or to connect with people? I mean, I certainly have, and if statistics are accurate, some of you probably have as well. If you were to ask me if I'd ever struggled with anxiety up until about a year ago, I would tell you that I don't even know what that means. In fact, I, as probably some of you, have ran through that Matthew 6 passage before several times in my life, and I've not even given it a second thought, but how can it be that when we consider that the number one mental illness of adults or people over 18 years old today is anxiety, and I would up in that, and I would say that probably above 12, the number one mental illness is anxiety. In an article for the Boston Globe, Dr. Susan Coven writes this. She says, in the past few years, I've observed an epidemic of sorts. Patient after patient suffering from the same condition. The symptoms of this condition include fatigue, irritability, insomnia, anxiety, headaches, heartburn, back pain, and weight gain. Anybody ever experienced that? There are no blood tests or x-ray diagnostics of this condition, yet it is easy to recognize the condition is excessive busyness. Looking back now, I had all of those symptoms. I mean, anxiety, stress, fatigue, irritability. My wife would tell you I had weight gain and on and on. But I struggled to admit to myself that I was just too busy. And see, here's the biggest issue with busyness that I've come to find myself. It's all my fault. It's all our fault. I mean, busyness is our choice. I mean, look what Jesus says in our passage in verse 41 um, he says, My dear Martha, you are worried and upset over all of these details. But Mary has discovered the one thing that is worth being uh, concerned about, and it's not going to be taken away from her. The one thing that Mary had discovered and that she was concerned about was a relationship with Jesus. It's the relationship. And so when I look at my life, when I'm overworked, overwhelmed, stressed out, crunched for time, my relationships will always suffer as a result. However, whenever I build margin into my schedule, I make time for being in relationship with God and in relationship with other people, then everything else seems to become to prosper. Now, you may be asking, as I did, what does margin actually mean? And it's as simple as taking two pieces of paper. If you can imagine with me for a second, a piece of copy paper, it's completely blank. There's nothing on it. And so if, if you're like me and you take notes on copy paper, whenever you write, you sometimes will run out of room to write because as you're writing, there's nothing to tell you that you are getting towards the end of the paper. Whereas if you use a notebook paper, there is lines on the side and above. It's margin. It's to warn you that you are about to go over the top. Margin is simply the space that keeps you from running off the page. Or maybe in life, margin is simply the tool that keeps you from spinning out of control. When we build margin into our schedule, we have time for being in a relationship with God and in relationship with other people. Chances are, some of us are stuck in chronic busyness. You may not say it that way. I mean, I'm, I never did. I, I certainly wouldn't say that. I would say things like this. I would say, I'm just trying to get ahead of everything right now. But in six months, it'll slow down. Or maybe it's, it's just a busy season right now. Once everything calms down, then I'm going to get margin back into my life. Or maybe another one, I'm just trying to take care of my spouse. Or some of you might say, we're trying to make a better life for our kids or our grandkids or our friends. And so it justifies all of this busyness. Or the one that's hardest for me to wrestle with is this one. You don't understand. I'm just trying to get to the top of whatever it is that I'm doing. If you've ever wrestled with any of this, 
or maybe you're wrestling with some of this today, then hang on. Because if we are willing to shift our focus, evaluate our priorities, and match our behaviors with our priorities, then we will begin to bring margin back into our lives. For those of you who don't know, I got married on September 5th, 2020. We were placing bets if I would remember the date or not. So. <laughs> and as a brand new husband, I was like many of you probably were. I had all these amazing plans. Uh, I wanted to do everything that I could think of that would, would make my wife happy. And so I started doing all of the things that the world would tell you would work, that I believed would work. Got new stuff at the house, new kitchen, new car, new, tried to win her over with things and trinkets, um, all of which began to take more and more of my time. In fact, I spent so much time trying to get things for her, I didn't realize it, but our time together had become to start to shrink day by day. And about six months in, a mentor of mine asked me how things were going. I said, you know, they're going pretty well, but I just feel like I'm missing something. And I told him all the stuff I'd be doing. I said, I've been working really hard. I've been getting all this stuff and just doing everything that I can possibly think to do. And he just laughs and looks at me and he goes, did you ever think that she probably just wanted you? Anybody relate to that? I mean, it knocked me to the floor. It was like, you know, it, it talks about the scripture being a double-edged sword. It was like I just got, I mean, just arrowed right on the, right on the target. Um, she just wants you. She just wants a relationship with you. I mean, I was spinning my wheels doing all of these things. For some of you in this room, maybe it's your kids, your grandkids, maybe your friends. But could it be this? Could it be that we are spending so much time trying to do things for the people that we care about the most, that we have sacrificed the margin to give them what they actually want, which is simply a relationship with us? And so I decided that day if I was going to change, I had to shift my focus. I had to shift my focus from what the world told me was important to what God told me was important. Because the world will tell you to work as hard as you can, make as much money as you can, so you can buy whatever you want to buy. God says to be generous and kind, to take time to focus on relationships both with God and with others, to build margin in your schedule so you can focus. I mean, it was amazing to see you guys greeting one another because we took time to talk to each other. You know, how many churches have you sat in that that, that sacrificed? It's one of my favorite things about our church is that we take time to meet each other where we're at. And so um, Eric said that we are a disciple-making church, a church that is calling everyone in this room to become disciples of Jesus Christ. And so if we're going to begin the process of getting unstuck in the area of busyness, we absolutely must start with shifting our focus to him. A disciple is someone who simply follows the teachings of another. And by that definition, in our, our last message, considering our, our message last week on idolatry, we are all disciples of something. So let me ask you, who are you a disciple of? Who are you following? Do you follow the worldly pursuit of success, or do you follow the godly pursuit of significance? Maybe a better question would be, what's your scorecard? How do you keep score? How do you know at the end of the day if it was a good day or if it was a bad day? Because by the world standards, here's a few metrics that I've wrestled with myself, and those of you that, are, uh, that, that maybe recently graduated high school can relate to this. Um, when I was growing up as a kid, we didn't have a ton of money, and so uh, my big thing when I was growing up was, man, I cannot wait till the day that I make $40,000. When I make $40,000, all of my problems are going to be solved. <laughs> and then I made $40,000, and then I made fifty. dollars and for some of us, we probably are in that, and we continue to go up, and we continue to make more money, and honestly, that number continues to go up. And it seems like we're stuck on this runaway train, shoveling fire into the furnace for lack of a better option. If we just had more, if we just had more stuff, more money, more whatever, what I'm suggesting, maybe we just need more margin to do what God has called us to do. Um, you know, for me, it was I need to have a more powerful position in my organization, I need to be a higher ranking leader so that I can have more power, um, need more power prestige so that I can show everybody that I'm this, uh, need to provide more for my family, uh, need, to, need to, I mean, all of the things that we, we probably chase in this world. And those are just some of the scorecards. But here's my take on God's scorecard. 
as a result of Christ's life, death, burial, and resurrection, we are to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. It may be better summed up in a few questions. Here are the questions that I think that God is asking us at the end of the day. When it's all said and done, did you spend time with me and get to know me? Did you spend time with my people and make them disciples of me? Did you love the people that you came into contact with? That's it. What's on your scorecard right now? If you don't have one, then chances are you're falling into some of the ways that the world would keep score. And so I want to challenge us as a church to wrestle with this this week. How do we keep score? And how do we need to shift that focus to align more with what God has called us to do? When I began struggling with time and just busyness and overwhelm, uh, this quote by John Maxwell really stuck out to me. He said, there's no such thing as time management. There is only self-management. Time cannot be managed. It cannot be controlled in any way. Everyone gets the same number of hours and minutes every day. Another one that I seem to come back to all the time is this. Um, You ever felt like you just need more time? And so I come back to this quote that says, we all have the same 24 hours in a day. And the truth is, if we don't have time, we really just don't have priorities. And so the second step that we need to take is we need to evaluate our priorities. This brings us back to Jesus' Sermon on the Mount where he says in Matthew 20 or 6, 27, can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? I mean, we all have the same 24 hours in a day, so the question is, how are we going to spend it? Maxwell would tell you that um, successful people make the right decisions early in life, and then they manage those decisions the rest of their life. We all have that same 24 hours in our day, but our priorities are going to determine how we spend that time. If you call yourself a believer in Christ this morning and you're seeking to be his disciple, then we not only have to use his scorecard, but we have to use his priorities. One of God's priorities is the priority of Sabbath. In Exodus 34, 21, it says, You have six days each week for your ordinary work, but on the seventh day you must stop working even during the seasons of plowing and harvest, even during the busiest of seasons. You see, God gave his people a day of rest, and traditionally they actually began this day of rest on sundown the day before. So for us, it would be like we rested from Saturday evening to Sunday evening. In essence, each day began with working from rest, not the other way around. We've somehow switched that. You know, they understand that rest was God's gift to them. Maybe rest is not a priority for us because it's an issue of our trust. Because to completely rest, it means to go completely off. It means we are most vulnerable when we are at rest. And for God, rest was one step that his people can take each week to reveal where their faith lied. Let me ask you this morning, based on the way that you spend your time, do you have more faith in God or do you have more faith in yourself? Because for me, oftentimes it's myself. Another one of God's priorities is the priority of connection between man and God. As disciples of Christ, we are to follow and learn from him. And the Bible says over and over again throughout his ministry, Jesus would withdraw from the crowd to connect with God. I'm just going to quote a passage here from Luke chapter 5. It says, In one of the villages, Jesus met a man with an advanced case of leprosy. When the man saw Jesus, he bowed with his face to the ground, begging to be healed. Lord, he said, if you are willing, you can heal me and make me clean. Jesus reached out and touched him. He said, I am willing, be healed. And instantly the leprosy disappeared. Then Jesus instructed, instructed him not to tell anyone what had happened. He said, go to the priest and let him examine you. Take along the offering that is required in the law of Moses for those who have been healed of leprosy. This will be a public testimony that you have been cleansed. And then here's the, here's the catch. But despite Jesus' instructions, the report of his power spread even faster, and vast crowds would come to hear him preach and be healed of their dis- diseases, good things, healing people of diseases, teaching them to obey what God has called them to do. These are all good things. But verse 16 says, but Jesus often withdrew to the wilderness 
uh, for prayer. In the middle of chaos, Jesus forewent the opportunity to seek the power, the prestige, the notoriety from a crowd, and he would consistently withdraw to a wilderness for prayer. He would consistently withdraw for an intentional time to connect with God. We do that? I mean, is our prayer life not Bible study, not groups, not church, not mission trips, even though those are all phenomenal things to do, is your daily prayer, prayer life, or let me, let me uh, hyphen that and say, your personal relationship with God, is that a priority to you? Because Abraham Lincoln is famous for saying, if you give me six hours to chop down a tree, I'll spend the first four of those sharpening the axe. The force multiplier for cutting down a tree is a sharp axe. Maybe the force multiplier for our lives is to connect with God in a personal way. Because God's not after our stuff. I mean, he literally could take that whenever he wants. He's after us. He wants to connect with us. And what we see through the course of all of the scriptures is in the midst of an unending mission to reach people, Jesus consistently withdrew from the crowd to connect with God. So that has to be our priority. And then the last priority of God's, uh, of God's is to connect with people. Make time to intentionally connect with people. That's why we do growth groups here. Okay, uh, Matthew twenty-eight nineteen through twenty says, "Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded to you." And the question is, is that actually a priority for us, or is it just a great verse? I mean, the thing is, this has been a priority of God since the beginning. In Genesis 12, 1 through 3, the Lord says to Abraham, Leave your native country, your relatives, your father's family. Go to the land that I'm going to show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you, and I will make you famous, and you will be such a blessing to others. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who treat you with contempt. All of the families on earth will be blessed through you. God called Abram like God called Jesus, like God called all of us in this room to connect with people, to care about them. And if we don't make that a priority in our life, then it is very likely the people in our lives will not see God within us. Because godly priorities are connecting with God, connecting with people, and honoring the Sabbath. Whereas the world's priorities is to make money, chase power, and to take what is rightly yours. Our priorities will reveal whose disciple we are. Are we the world's or are we God's? And so we've shifted our focus. We've defined our priorities, what we need to focus on. And now we need to realign our behaviors with our priorities. Because if we truly want to follow Christ, we have to change our behavior. Our behavior will lead us to the results that we're going to get. This story that I'm about to tell you is awesome. If you want to just cut the rest of the sermon and just hear what I'm about to tell you, you will get your money's worth this morning. This story is so powerful. So please lock in for the, just this story. Cause this, when I read this, I didn't come up with this. It's awesome. Okay. So just hone in right here. Cause this is good. <laughs> a wealthy American went down to a fishing dock and saw a fisherman. And he asked him if he'd been out fishing. The man replied only a little while. The American then asked why he didn't stay out longer and catch more fish. The man said, well, He'd caught enough to meet his family's needs. The American then asked, but what do you do with the rest of your time? The fisherman said, I sleep late. I fish a little. I play with my kids. I spend afternoons with my wife. I sip a little wine. And I play guitar with my friends. The businessman scoffed. He said, you should spend more time fishing with the proceeds you buy a bigger boat. With the proceeds from the bigger boat, you can buy several boats. Eventually, you would have a fleet of fishing boats. Instead of selling your fish to the middleman, you would sell directly to the process, eventually opening up your own cannery. You would control the product, the processing, and the distribution. You would need to leave this small coastal fishing village, move to Mexico City, L.A., New York City, where you will run your expanding enterprise. The fisherman asked, how long is this going to take? The American replied, 15 to 20 years. 
And the fisherman said, well, then what? He said, well, you're going to make millions. And the guy said, then what? And the American said, then you're going to retire. You're going to move to a small fishing village where you're going to sleep late. You're going to fish a little. You're going to play with your kids. You're going to spend time with your wife. And you're going to stroll to the village. And you're going to play guitar with your friends. Or maybe Solomon put it better in Ecclesiastes 2. He said, So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me, and my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would just take it. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all of my labors. But as I examined everything, as I looked at everything that I had worked so hard to get, it was all so meaningless. It was like chasing the wind, and there was nothing really worthwhile in front of me. You see, a worldly focus with worldly priorities is going to lead us to worldly behaviors. But a godly focus with godly priorities is going to lead us to godly behaviors. When I was 14... My life was forever changed Uh, with the passing of my father. Um, And then in the next year, the passing of my grandparents. And when I looked into my dad's eyes as he was passing away, I could see this incredible pain. It was interesting because I felt the same pain. And it wasn't physical pain. It was the pain of a missed chance. It was the pain of a missed opportunity. You see, right before, on the night he passed away, right before the night he passed away, when I walked into the house, he tried to talk, to connect, right? He tried to connect with me. And I was so focused on what I was doing where I was going, I was 14. So focused on what I was doing. Didn't have a clue what was about to happen. And I passed it up. And that was the pain that I felt. The pain that he felt might have been the times that he missed that opportunity. But it was like this just crystal clear moment that I can remember of that missed opportunity. I've never known anyone who got to the end of their life and wished they could have worked more or made more money or did more for themselves. But as I looked into my dad's eyes, it became crystal clear to me that the pain we were feeling was from the times that we chose to be busy instead of focusing on our relationships. Because time is so fleeting. It's just gone. As Solomon would say, it's like chasing the wind. You can't slow it down. And so we must take advantage of every opportunity we have to capitalize on the opportunities that God is going to put in front of us today, tomorrow, next week, So we don't miss it. Now that I almost bawled, uh, we're going to come to the fun part of the message. The part of the day where we need to examine our lives to see what we need to change. Because where the rubber is always going to meet the road is when God's words will call us to give control, routine, and comfort to follow him. And so here's a few questions that I believe will help us get margin back into our lives. The first one is this. I don't know if we'll get them on the screen or not, but these are, these are good. And these, are like, these aren't meant to be answered today. These are meant to like be discussed with you know, your, your wife, your friends, your family, whatever. So uh, the first one is this. Think about everything that you do on an annual, seasonal, weekly, daily basis, like the stuff you always do. 
and reflect on this question and ask yourself, of all of these things that I'm doing, all these projects, all these people that I interact with, what are the three to five things that I know God doesn't want me to do? That I, they, they may be good things. They just don't line up with what God's called me to do. And then the second one, now think about everything that you do on an annual, seasonal, weekly, the stuff you normally do, and reflect on this question. Of all of these things that I do, all these people that I interact with, all of the stuff, who, are the, who or what are the three to five things that most line up with what God's called me to do? Maybe it's going to growth group. Maybe it's coming to church. Maybe it's reading your Bible every day. Maybe it's having a group of people that you can connect with to discuss God's word with. You know, I don't know what it is, but whatever those three to five things are that are helping your, your faith, keep doing those and stop doing the other stuff. Because as we reflect on this question or discuss this um, this afternoon, what I think we're going to find is that there are things in our life we simply just got to let go of. Balls we need to stop trying to juggle. Wheels we need to stop trying to spin because they are literally spinning us out of control. And so let me ask you this. What are you currently doing in your life? What are we currently doing in our lives that we need to let go of? What can we eliminate so that we can free ourselves up to connect with God and to connect with others on a more consistent basis. In John 15, Jesus speaks about a pruning process. He says, I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that does not bear fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will become even more fruitful. Even the good stuff got pruned. Even the good things got pruned. So what do we need to do to prune so that we can become more fruitful? What are we holding on to that we need to let go? Is it our career? Is it our retirement? Is it our savings, our personal time, our kids, our hobbies, our, our pride? The chase of what the world has told us we've got to go get? Are you weary? Are you burdened? Are you stressed out? Are you just at your wit's end and you just don't know where to turn? And let me suggest to you this morning to turn and connect with Jesus Christ. Not just talk about it. Turn and connect with Jesus Christ. He says in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you are, all of you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am a gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. We need to let go of this world and let go of this chase, this, this chasing after the wind. Lay down our burdens, lay down our pain, because God's call in our lives is always, always all about relationships. It's not about our online portfolio, our resume, our status, our favorite sports team, or whatever our per hour productivity output is. It's always about relationships. God's call for us is to be disciples who make disciples. His call is to connect with him, to connect with each other, to connect with people who don't know him yet. Our call is to take that extra second to get to know the person that's our waiter or our waitress, or to talk to the cashier or the coworker that you just kind of slip by every day, or the person in your growth group that you don't talk to, or maybe the person in church that you don't talk to. His call is for us to connect with each other because it's a relationship. And the best thing that we can do is to run to the simplicity because the first thing that we will throw out whenever our life gets complicated and busy is our relationships. If you find yourself this morning stuck in an ongoing cycle of chronic busyness, then God brought you here this morning to give you this message. He brought you here to tell you to come back to a relationship with him, to come back to his way of doing things, to come back to his house, to build a relationship with him. He brought you here to tell you these words from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 6. He says, That is why I tell you, do not worry about your everyday life. Whether you have enough food and drink or enough clothes to wear, isn't life more than food and your body more than clothing? Look at the birds. They don't plant or harvest or store food in barns because your heavenly Father feeds them. And aren't you far more valuable to him than they are? 
Can all of your worries add a single moment to your life? And why worry about your clothing? Look at the lilies of the field and how they grow. They don't work or make their clothing. Yet Solomon in all of his glory was not dressed as beautifully as they are. And if God cares so wonderfully for the wildflowers that are here today and thrown into the fire tomorrow, he will certainly care for you. Why do you have so little faith? So don't worry about these things, saying what will we eat or what will we drink or what will we wear. These things dominate the thoughts of unbelievers. But your heavenly Father already knows all of your needs. So seek the kingdom of God above all else, live righteously, and he will give you everything that you need. So don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring its own worries. Today's trouble is enough for today. If we want to get unstuck, we have to shift our focus from what the world has told us is important to what God has shown us is important. We have to embrace the godly priorities of being in a relationship with him and in a relationship with the people in our lives. And the last thing we need to do is we need to align our behavior to actually reflect the things that we've said are important in our life. So I think we've answered the question that Jesus asked us in verse 27. Can all of our worries add a single moment to our life? No. So then the next question. And the one I want to leave you with this morning is if that's true, what do we need to let go of? What worries, maybe what activities, what projects do we need to let go of so that we can have margin to be the people that God has called us to be?